Greetings, my name is Tom Banchoff of Georgetown University, and I'm delighted to be here with five colleagues from the Culture of Encounter and the Global Agenda Project to continue our conversations together, to share some reflections um, and engage with one another on this topic. Uh, we've been working at this for almost a year now, uh, delving into the idea uh, and the practice of the Culture of Encounter, one of the key concepts of the papacy uh, of Pope Francis, multi-dimensional concept uh, along uh, many different uh, angles. Uh, we were able to get together as a project in May and most of the folks here on the call joined us in Rome for an in-person extended dialogue around these questions. And there we were joined by others uh, in Rome, uh, including Archbishop Paul Gallagher, of the Secretary of State who gave a keynote, Father Otoro Sosa, Superior General of the Society of Jesus. So uh, that interaction, um, which we may allude to in our conversation today, was definitely a backdrop for uh, our reflections and for our conversation. Um, what we've got here are five members of uh, our project, three colleagues of mine uh, from Georgetown, Jose Casanova, Jocelyn Cesari and David Hollenbach of Society of Jesus, as well as Scott Thomas of the University of Bath in the UK and Ahmed Ali Bashish of the University of Sarajevo. Uh, and um, we're grouped together for a smaller conversation uh, because all of you have written about big questions uh, around religion and encounter as global challenges, questions relating to international diplomacy, questions. Uh, relating to global governance, questions relating to interreligious dialogue, uh, not just at the national, but also at the global level. So we thought it made sense to come together and share some reflections. We'll go around um, and then we'll have a second round of reflections as you have an opportunity to engage with one another. So again, welcome. And Scott, let me turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Tom. I think perhaps my uh, contribution to this project as a scholar of international relations can itself be seen as a type of encounter, dialogue, build bridging, bridge building between the church, Catholic social doctrine, and those concerned about or those engaged with foreign affairs or international affairs. So the purpose of my interventions, I think, is to engage how theology, spirituality, and the theory of international relations really can come together to form a way of seeing the world, interpreting the world, and how the culture of encounter can assist uh, or influence global governance in relation to a series of global issues, and of course now facing us. So this culture of encounter and its concepts of fraternity, inclusive citizenship, social peace, and social friendship can helpfully assist or influence this process of global governments, I think in many ways is inseparable from the level of analysis in the theory of international relations. It's important to recognize that the individual, society, state, international society levels of analysis are all very important because issues, tensions, problems at the global or local level are all multi-dimensional. And indeed, Pope Francis has grappled with this by his image of the world as a polyhedron, as a football or as a soccer ball, rather than a sphere. And so it's important to recognize these various levels of analysis and relate what happens to each of these levels as the sources of an overall understanding of some global issue or event. Now, if this seems really theoretical, it's actually very practical since any kind of hopeful, creative, social, political, prophetic action or approach to global governance refugee crisis, the food crisis, climate change, needs to successfully handle this aspect of international relations. Now, it's worthwhile revisiting Fratelli Tutti, because Pope Francis's catechesis on the parable of the Good Samaritan, right at the beginning, alludes to the level of analysis problem. Relation to fraternity and social friendship and culture of encounter. He says we can start from below case by case act at the most concrete and local levels that expand to the furthest reaches of our country and indeed out to the world. So Pope Francis, right from the beginning, alludes to this, but also before this, to this notion of the polyhedron as a type of global governance. 
rooted in fraternity and in social friendship. He says, we have the space we need at each level of analysis for co-responsibility in creating and putting into place new processes and changes. Now here he's referring to one of his four principles, time is greater than space. Giving priority to time means being concerned about initiating processes rather than possessing spaces. This is a great pushback against power politics and possessing power over spaces because this speaks arguably to debates, to debates about effective global governance and the level of analysis about structure, process and interaction capacity of actors. Now also the culture of encounter is very much related to for global governance to the agency structure problem international relations. This is basically how do we reconcile the fact that if we want human agency, it's the only force behind what's can take place in terms of social action, but in fact, social, but in fact itself is actually conditioned by historical circumstances. So agency and structure relate to each other. And indeed for Pope Francis, creativity is the active dimension of hope. So any person can creatively become or learn to become strategic to become a person with agency, to encounter, dialogue, recognizing new opportunities or possibilities at what? At each level of analysis. So in Pope Francis's political anthropology, agency is the way vision, creativity and imagination by anyone as an individual or likely as a people can mobilize, collaborate as an active dimension of hope at each of these level of analysis on what activities to meet you basic human needs, develop specific projects, and then he builds and says new institutions over the long term. Again, his principle that time is greater than space, this allusion to the polyhedron. So therefore, on specific global issues, perhaps revisiting the culture of encounter and this related concepts in the level of analysis and agents and structure might reveal practical challenging agenda for action regarding each level of analysis on which helpfully or hopefully might highlight what the church, the dicasteries are already doing, but also in ways that identify perhaps new actors, new possibilities, and can also perhaps build bridges to secular scholars, governments, and foreign ministries. And for those who are concerned about churchy language, also get over the problem of separation of church and state. So the, I think also this intersection of historical theology and the history of international relations theory might bring up interesting examples and lessons about prophetic action in past historic types of international society. So in this sense, theology, spirituality, and the theory of international relations are all wrapped up in a kind of holistic and integrated vision of meeting today's global issues and hope and creativity for the world and every creature in it. But I will just conclude, I think, by, say, by saying a little bit about international society, because the big question in international relations is, does it exist? Well, this is treated too much as a, as a kind of static question. But in relation to the idea of repetition, recurrence, and renewal in international relations, I'm thinking here of actually Psalm 90. Uh, international society is ever new, ever fading, and requires renewal in every age, in every historic type of international society. And so the same is true today. It's indeed possible to interpret Laudato Se and Fratelli Tutti as prophetic criticism of the existing international system, the idea that some kind of legal contractual uh, constructed approach to international society is going to be up to the challenges we have we have today. And this is where also the, uh, the lectures by Archbishop Gallagher and Monsignor Sosa, the General Secretary of the Jesuits, who are talking about the natural society of nations, this great concept of international society going back uh, in history, but also, in fact, it's been brought out by the early scholars of the School of International Relations, the English School of International Relations, Martin White, who directly related 
uh, the Catholic social teaching to his rationalist tradition of international theory. And this is something that hasn't been adequately uh, investigated, but also because that tradition is rooted in natural law. And we're now coming to a point of a globalizing international civil society or society relating to culture and culture and religion. Perhaps this approach also offers an opportunity for greater dialogue between the Abrahamic faiths within this tradition to discuss the future prospects for resolving significant issues in global affairs. In other words, notice what I'm doing here. I'm trying to embed the ideas of basic Catholic social teaching into the debate within international relations theory, partly because I want to engage not only religious folks and who use churchy language, but also the secular folks out there who are also concerned about the world. But, but this also offers an opportunity to bring together varieties of actors and given what I was saying earlier, to see new prospects at each level of analysis where people can be working together for the entire system of the notions of global governance is only going to work if each one of these levels and things going on in these levels help contribute to it. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Um, that's a wonderful introduction to many of the things we'll be talking about today and that we've been wrestling with over the past year. Uh, together. Uh, over to you, Jose. Well, thank you, Tom, and thank you, Scott, for this uh, great introduction. Um, the point I wanted to make in my presentation was uh, that if we want to pursue a globalization of fraternity, which is ultimately the goal of promoting the culture of the encounter, uh, precisely to diminish the existing globalization of indifference, we must take into account first, we must really seriously take into account the structural constraints in the institutional system, both capitalist, economic, and political, that simply are to a certain extent uh, impeding the possibility of taking seriously, precisely uh, institutionalizing the culture of the encounter within these two systems, within the international system of the states and within the capitalist system. And here is where uh, the radical prophetic voice of uh, Pope Francis, when in Fratelli Tutti, coming out of the uh, pandemic, uh, says if after seeing the failure of the global system to respond to the challenges, and he lists all the challenges, inequality, uh, public health, uh, uh, refugees, uh, ecological crisis, none of these crises we've seen in the last decades, are being addressed systematically by the two systems. And so we need to think seriously of which other normative resources, which other institutional resources we may find uh, precisely to address those issues. And so the idea is that uh, the capitalist economy, I mean, in the, in the, in the prophetic terms of, of uh, Pope Francis again, the economy kills kills, but not in the old sense of the Marxist critique, because it needs the exploitation of labor to reproduce itself, but rather because the modern capitalism doesn't need a lot of the population. They can be discarded. They are not needed by the system. They cannot become stakeholders of the Davos consensus. And therefore, it's a system which is built not to include everybody, but simply to reproduce itself and it can do it very well today while uh, abandoning, discarding large sections of the population in the peripheries of the global south, but also in the peripheries of the more advanced north, where inequality is also increasing day by day. The same goes for the international system of states. As, as Francis put it bluntly, we've seen the UN system doesn't work. And it doesn't work precisely because the Security Council is built in such a way that the superpowers, which are supposed to precisely implement the rules, which are valid for everybody, they themselves can break the rules because of their veto power. And under those conditions, and the, and the war in Ukraine has made this obvious, and the, the disarray in the war international system, and the possibilities of once again entering a new kind of polarized war between the democratic West 
and the rest, that we need to rethink those issues. And I think that here again, the notion of beginning from below, of looking for the resources within global civil society, the normative, the institutional resources, already the uh, existing NGOs. And here is where both transnational religious institutions have really, really a, a networks as no other uh, uh, institution in the world, but also the secular institutional networks of humanitarian, of, of humanitarian aid, global NGOs. So the question is how to precisely bring these resources together to think creatively how to institutionalize the culture of the encounter. And I would even go further and said the preferential option for the poor, which is not anymore simply a prophetic cry coming out of faith, but it is a, a realist humanism shows us that the weakest, the poor are suffering are the ones that take basically the, 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 the damage in each of these crises. So if we want to address all these crises, inequality, uh, uh, immigration, ecological crisis, uh, uh, peace uh, uh, and, and peacemaking, that we must, we must precisely look particularly and take this preferential option for the poor, for the weak, for those who suffer the most, for those who are discarded uh, precisely uh, uh, into account. And this, uh, you say, is not only a religious impulse, because actually uh, the newest uh, uh, open survey from the open society, public survey, trying to precisely answer the question, is there an international society? And, and, the, and the survey shows, yes, there is a majority of opinion uh, willing to uh, address global issues beyond the purely national interest. There are majorities in every region of the world which are willing to think that, yes, we need to look at these global issues and address them to the point of, let's say, proposing or accepting, putting aside the 2% of the, of the budget, of the national budget for precisely this kind of emergencies, global use humanitarian emergencies, uh, in addition to the 10, 2% that NATO has been trying to, to, to institutionalize for national security. So the idea is let's be creative, let's use the resources we have, let's build bridges between secular and religious institutions, let's build bridges across religious institutions, across religious traditions, and let's simply <laughs> get together and begin working, uh, uh, time cr creating the kind of time horizons for the future that may, may, may institutionalize uh, some means of, of precisely addressing those issues. Thank you, Jose. Again, lots of great issues to come back to in our, in our conversation. Uh, I wanna turn it over to you now, Jocelyn. Yes, hello. Thank you, Tom, and uh, thank you for this initiative. And uh, I would like to start some uh, comments on, on the speech of uh, Archbishop Gallagher, where he mentioned that in order to create the condition for peace and civility, we have to indeed foster what he considered the same thing, culture of encounter and dialogue. And here, uh, as we are moving on to the next phase of this project, I think it's uh, time to differentiate both. We have been doing now in this project um, initiative that you can call indeed encounter between different expertise, different traditions, different cultures, the dialogue involves something a little more demanding, which is a, a level field, meaning everybody involved in this discussion has also to have some stake and power to modify things. And that's where I think we should add a tour in order to really implement the principles that are written in the, uh, fratelli tutti. So what does it mean exactly to um, have power to bring up these ideas of equality, dignity, and social justice? It means that um, we cannot just 
stay at the level of discussion. And what we have done in a year is indeed to prove that there are people of good willing who are sharing this idea and are ready to move together. How do we go from there to a real impact on international affairs? And that's where I would like to insist on the dimension of religion that is always lost, especially in the West, which is that religion is not only an individual feature, it's also a communal uh, way of mobilization. And what uh, we need to revive internationally is the legitimacy of religious communities to say things, not only on, on social issues, which means, of course, religions can do in different contexts, social work, welfare, assistance, uh, and so on. But the idea here, and that's why I prefer the term social all, is about having the legitimacy to say things about the common good for the whole community at large, not only nationally, but internationally. And this cannot be heard in the current international system if there is no institution to support such a voice. And um, this also goes beyond the interface approach that dominates the status of religion at the international level. If it's about social uh, projects, it's not only limited to denominations coming together. The criterion of organization is about the issue with all religion behind and not the opposite. And that's also something that is very challenging, not only for the secular organizations, but as well <laughs> for the groups themselves that have been used, uh, including by the expectation of the secular international system to come up as different entities. And um, I think we are at a moment uh, where there is a greater awareness in this international order of the relevance of religion uh, as a tool to change indeed um, the, the social role order. Of course, it's not said this way, but the way that religious communities have been uh, very central in the management of the pandemic and not only to pass on the guidelines of the secular public health organization, but also to provide assistance, uh, community sense to people who are pretty much lost alone in their home. This has not gone unnoticed. And so there is right now a window of opportunity to uh, move up religion beyond the interface dialogue and the discussion to show the capacity of religious communities to be mobilized beyond transcendental and spiritual issues on, on uh, topics of um, social order, renewal of the social contract, with ideas that indeed are brought up by, by Pope Francis about dignity and morality, and that are, um, I would say, shared by all members of religious tradition today, especially the young people. So <laughs> in the essay I wrote for the, for the project, uh, I was suggesting that maybe not the whole of Vatican, but the dicastery that are very much involved in promoting this global governance, maybe this would be a time to think of building of their work to include more and um, uh, more community level uh, members of different faiths to move up some of this work into an institution like an NGO that would be moral and religious in its core without having a particular denomination with all religious groups working in it. And, and I think there is um, uh, some kind of expectation or even attention that would be brought to such an initiative from different community and grassroots level uh, groups about different religious and especially the young people. So um, 
In other words, if we want to move the culture of encounter to a real impact on politics, there is something here about institutionalization that has to be thought through. And it also means that the, the question is not anymore about talking. It's not also anymore about uh, scaring the secular order that religious groups are going to take on states. It's about bringing up some moral um, prerogatives at the international level without religious communities doing the policy making. And this is eminently political. You don't have to run election or to be head of a state to, to have a political role. And I think today, religious communities may be one of the group that can uh, bring up this, this transformation, again, from the local uh, to the global. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jocelyn. Um, David, over to you. Thank you, Tom. I'm grateful to be with you in this conversation. I would like to uh, build upon what has already been said by all of our previous speakers. The culture of encounter, it seems to me, is flowing naturally from a tradition that is very deep within Roman Catholicism namely that the human person is fundamentally social, fundamentally engaged in community. And Pope Francis is trying to bring that to the forefront in our thinking about international affairs. He talks about the possibility in international relationships of achieving a certain kind of social friendship or political friendship which is bonding people together in a shared regard and a shared support for one another. Now, the big challenge that emerges from this is that although you can speak about the essentially social nature of the person, we have multiple social relationships. Scott Thomas highlighted the fact that there are multiple levels in which our interaction take place. Or another way, another image to use it is that we live in a, in a set of concentric circles of relationship, uh, ranging all the way from very intimate relationships of friendship, marriage, family, which are a, and a realization of the social reality of human personhood or on the local level, in the local neighborhoods that we live in, or in our country, the nation state is a, a domain in which there's an important set of social relations and we have obligations to our co-citizens, those who are citizens with us. Patriotism is the support for that kind of community that exists on the level of the nation state, and that's a very legitimate concern. But then what Pope Francis is trying to do is to try to, to urging us to recognize that our social relationships, our bonds of interconnection, our bonds of solidarity and friendship ought to reach beyond the nation state to the globe, to people around the world, that the the possibility of social friendship across national borders is certainly stressed very strongly by him. Now, of course, this raises a very fundamental question about how do we relate those different levels of relationship to one another? The rise of nationalism is obvious today, uh, and it's a, a stress on saying, the people who count are the people in my country not those others in other parts of the world, or certain kinds of ethnic, ethnic emphases. The people that count are the people like me. And that can even take on a religious dimension. The people that count are my fellow religionists. And this is surely, uh, there is surely a responsibility to people of my own country, to people of my fellow that are co-religionists with me, but it's not the whole story. We have to reach beyond that. And that raises the challenging question of how to do that. 
And what Pope Francis is doing, it seems to me, is he, he loves in Fratelli Tutti, he uses the parable of the Good Samaritan that's taught by Jesus as a good way of thinking about how to reach beyond the boundaries of nation state or ethnicity or religion. Um, a man falls into the hands of robbers on the road between Jerusalem and Jericho, and he is seriously assaulted. He's left half dead lying by the side of the road in great need. And the priest and the Levite, fellow Jews to the man who has been abused and left by the side of the road, walk by, see the man, but are not touched by this and just keep moving. But the good Samaritan, the Samaritan coming from an outgroup, the group of Samaritans who were regarded as in some sense enemies of the Jewish people, the Samaritan walks by, sees the man who is in need and responds to him, picks him up, takes him to the inn, binds up his wounds and cares for him. What Francis is doing with that parable is suggesting, it seems to me, that although our loyalties to those who are near us and who are already bonded to us are important, there can be an obligation that reaches beyond the borders of religion or nationality or ethnicity whenever there is extreme need. When persons are in great need, we need to reach beyond the boundaries of our in-group to respond to those who are struggling. And I think that that parable is used by Francis to suggest that although we have duties to our own countrymen, and women, we also have duties to those in the world who are in need, which is the vast majority of people around the world who are facing economic situations that are very great. So that leads us then to say that certain kinds of priority need to be given to the response to need around the world, to response to those who are strangers, but who are needy, and that we need to respond to that. And when we're walking by and see them, they are proximate to us, we have an increased responsibility to respond. When we have the capacity to respond, we have a duty to do so. And therefore, I think that this is one of the ways in which Pope Francis is accepting the reality of fellow citizens as those to whom we have duties, but he also wants to say, the duties can reach beyond that, especially toward those who are in need, those who are poor, and those who are threatened in some way or another uh, by oppression. So I would suggest that that opens the path for us to think about how to address the reality of the nationalism that is so prevalent in the world today, and especially the religious nationalism that is challenging us in a very important way today and that neither nation state duties nor fellow religious duties can, can excuse us when we fail to respond to the refugees, the poor, and the struggling of our world today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's remarkable to see how the themes are connecting across your different presentations, and we'll have time for a wider conversation, but before that, Ahmed, uh, what are your reflections? I'm very grateful uh, for being part of this conversation, uh, Tom. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, my presence here obviously testifies to the fact that I agree with the main contents of the Culture of uh, Engagement Initiative. Uh, however, uh, listening to, to us over these uh, Zoom conversations and uh, in Rome, uh, I have this feeling that um, the whole process might be proceeding a little too fast uh, when engagement of the religious other is concerned in certain communities. It looks like th this is too advanced for some, uh, some communities and uh, um, it seems to me that this is coming from a church, from an institution that has been uh, engaging the other 
uh, for systematically for 60 plus years. And not even all the branches of the Catholic community are able to follow, okay? And uh, obviously in other communities where such systematic effort has been lacking, they have even more difficult difficulty uh, following, uh, following, you know? So uh, my essay was about actually about the need for some unlearning and uh, before actually we learn and acquire uh, new attitudes and, and new skills that culture of, relig uh, of uh, engagement requires. So um, in a sense, I, I, I think my essay can be related to what David was talking about, kind of preparatory works, uh, clarifying things and, and deconstructing certain popular uh, attitudes. Um, so one, in my opinion, one major area where some unlearning, serious unlearning needs to take place is the way uh, the conflicts are framed, the framing, uh, popular framing of uh, conflicts, whereby religion is regular, regularly implicated as the main cause of uh, those conflicts. And uh, you find this attitude, uh, especially among the religious uh, religious people, at least in the region I, I, come, I come from. So uh, my idea was that uh, intra-faith conflicts are actually very useful in, the, in, in, in busting this myth of internal and ever-present um, religious conflicts and clash of cultures, if you want. So um, this particular type of conflict where we have conflict among the members of one religious group or culture, culture uh, helps us actually deconstruct this uh, popular idea about the conflicts. Uh, and unfortunately, it's often missing from the narratives about the conflicts. And it's missing not because there are not many intra-community or intra-faith uh, conflicts, it's simply that uh, simply the case that you know people tend to ignore them. Talking about Muslim uh, Muslim community, for instance, they rarely talk about the, for instance, the separation of Pakistan and what happened during that process. Uh, they rarely talk about you know the victims of Yemen. Uh, somehow they are not. Uh, featuring pr as prominently as other Muslim victims who have been victimized by, by non-Muslims. So um, we need, I think, to talk a bit more about these intra-faith uh, conflicts, as is the case now in Ukraine, uh, because that helps us in uh, you know, uh, driving the, this uh, idea that all conflicts are not religious uh, home. Uh, on the other hand, different coalitions or uh, alliances that were interreligious throughout the history, and there were many actually, uh, are also helpful in a different uh, direction. Uh, because, you know, usually it is believed that when you have a war, you have, you know, uh, mono, mono blocks, so to say. But when you have uh, interreligious coalitions or alliances, then again, it goes against the popular uh, perception. Uh, and those coalitions actually and alliances were many, both in the past and uh, in the present. Uh, a book uh, written by Ian Almond uh, some time ago comes to mind, uh, which has, a, 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 I, think, I think, very interesting title, Two Faith Under One Banner when Muslims marched with Christians across European battlefields. And these alliances have been there for centuries, you know. Um, early Muslims used to celebrate the victories of Christian Byzantine army. Um, and until today, until early 20th century, when Muslims used to fight uh, for um, imperial armies in the First World War and Second World War, including Bosnian Muslims, okay? 
who used to think that they are engaging in jihad when defending the Austro-Hungarian uh, Empire. So uh, to conclude, um, before we, uh, or simultaneously with our efforts, and I really appreciate uh, the three contributions here that are talking about the institutionalization of this uh, effort, uh, simultaneously with that effort, I think we need to uh, address these lingering, so to say, uh, perceptions or question marks uh, that are very much present in the popular, uh, especially religious minds, uh, and in that way clear the way for a culture of encounter uh, to take uh, initiative to take to take uh, root. I think that's uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Ahmed. Thank you, all of you. Um, what a rich set of reflections, not just uh, on the idea of culture of encounter, the theoretical problems, but also where we go from here with this project, uh, what we can aspire to, what is practical as we think about how to develop and embed the idea of the culture of encounter at the at the global level. Scott, um, you reminded us of some of the, I would call them disciplinary boundaries to thinking creatively about how encounter can move up levels of analysis from the, the, the local to the global. Uh, Jose, you talked about the structural constraints, the economic and political system, which has failed us on a global level, but um, which still uh, persists and exercises power and uh, talked about the importance of transnational civil society, the need for new normative and institutional resources to build encounter a more inclusive approach to, to global governance. And Jocelyn, you, uh, agreed with that main line uh, of thought and develop what Jose had spoken of the critical role of religious communities and even suggested, even suggested ambitiously that there may be ways to institutionalize uh, religious voices uh, in, in global governance in, in new ways, not in isolation, but in dialogue with engagement with wider secular forces. And then we just heard a couple of um, I would say cautionary notes, David uh, pointing out um, the challenges uh, in moving from the local to the global, um, having to do with culture, uh, anthropology, the difficulty of widening our spheres of identification, uh, something the Pope uh, alludes to in, in pointing out the parable of the Good Samaritan, with, which is both uh, a moral imperative, but also a warning of how difficult the, the work is. And to that point, Ahmed, you pointed out, uh, you didn't chastise us, but you, you pointed out one has to be cautious. There's so much work to be done. And religious communities, for example, are moving at different speeds uh, in being able to encounter the other, partly because they all, uh, to different degrees, have their own internal uh, divides and divisions that need to be worked through. Um, and so, as you said, when we first met, I remember um, 10, 10 months or so ago, this is going to be a long process, uh, this project. There's a lot of work ahead. So we have a little time for a wider discussion. And I thought um, the best way to proceed was rather than me asking um, questions of you, just to ask each of you to reflect on what you've heard um, and provide some, some further thoughts. Um, and uh, Jocelyn has raised her hand. So I'm gonna let Jocelyn get us started. Yeah. I want to reflect indeed on the two different ways that we have been uh, looking at the current situation of religion. What is clear is that within each tradition, you have a uh, um, position about the religion is the cause, the other is evil, whatever the other is. But at the same time, they are within each tradition, um, groups and people who do not agree with that. So what do we do? Uh, I hear you, Ahmed. Um, I think what you are saying is important, but we cannot wait until all this unlearning process has been done. It has to be done, but I think there is still room to build with the, the expectation and position within each tradition of this uh, more global transnational position. And this I can say with quite comfort that 
it's in Islam, it's in Judaism, it's in all Christianity. You have the two, the nationalist agenda, the intolerant agenda, it's not gonna disappear. It has been here since the nation state and since the international system. What we are witnessing at the same time, and I think that's what the pandemic has showed, the, the greater interest uh, 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 brought to religion or, or to world religion by young people, by women, by secular people who could not even think that religion could be part of, of this communal mobilization. And it's there. So um, I'm not saying it's either or, but I don't think we can spend all our energy in the unlearning process. I think there is also time and, and space to start building above without annihilating them. Of course, these people live also in national context. Of course, they have some sometimes to be uh, threatened by or are threatened by the more nationalist and intolerant messages, but they are also there. And, and a, a more transversal, transnational approach can actually pull them out of uh, the, the Mm, uh, the limitation of what existing now with religion and state um, and uh, more, I would say, a chauvinistic agenda. That, that, uh, that's what I wanted to say. So it's neither nor, it's both. Ah, Ahmed, would you like to reply to that? Um... Uh, very brief. Absolutely agree, Jocelyn. And, and I think toward the end, I, I indicated it has to be simultaneous uh, because I agree with you, there is already enough commitment in all the communities, but uh, my point was we need to address the dilemmas uh, that still exist in minds of, of some people, or else uh, we may appear to be engaged in some naive or weird um, work, fantasies, you know, so that's all. Yeah, I fully agree with you. Thank you. Um, Scott, uh, over to you. Yes, I, I kind of wanted to follow up on this discussion of um, unlearning at one element, because one of the interesting debates in international relations theory has been that the creation myth of modern international relations of the 30 years wars, this religious war and Westphalia has completely been unpicked that, it, that you've got Christ, Muslims, um, Catholics and Protestants on both sides that, that they're not accepting necessarily that it's a wars of religion. Yet this is the founding, the way the founding myth has been articulated. So on the one hand, the that's recognizing that within a discipline itself is a is a catalytic kind of issue. If this becomes important for other jet for the current kinds of generations of students uh, studying. But I also wanted to come back to uh, David's comments. And one of my concerns is that the multiple levels of analysis for, for to engagement, to get the support, to all going up to the international, in, international, international level, um, I, I, the, the role of Henri du Lebac, Catholicism, Christ and the Destiny of Man, or social Catholicism, the, the, I mean, he was, on about the fact, why did France fall for Vichy? And he talked about a pietistic, narrow Catholicism when he said social Catholicism is actually an oxymoron, a redundant expression, because Catholicism is social. So he's going back to the sociality of doctrines and then drawing out the broader concerns for society and the political. So that to me is one important way from within a tradition to see, to cor correct, but it's also, and maybe David, some comments, of comments on this, for each one of these religious communities within the tradition, the intra-tradition, is to see a concern beyond the community as a part of one's understanding of spirituality, of understanding what it means to be within that tradition. Now, that's not the role of governments. But it is for those working at those bottom levels, but it has these larger implications upwards. David, would you like to jump in? But I uh, one one I agree very much with the the importance of the social connection and its expansion out to the global and international level. 
Um, one of the things that continues, though, to worry me, and this is probably my American experience of the rise of Christian nationalism in the United States, for example, or one could look at Christian nationalism in the Soviet, in the Russian situation vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine. Where is this coming from? In the United States, it certainly is coming from a misinterpretation of Christianity. There's no doubt about that. Uh, and for Pope Francis shows us why Christianity reaches out beyond any kind of nationalist impulse. But there are also reasons why those who support say, a more Trump-oriented rejection of the larger commitment to the rest of the world, at least sizable numbers of these people are doing so because they feel threatened by the existing situation. And that threat has economic dimensions to it because they feel they're being left out as the economy grows, as those that high levels of education get richer and richer. Those with lesser education are falling behind and they resent it. And it leads to the sort of surge of a kind of nationalist impulse. So I guess one of the questions that I would have is, how do we address the rise of the forces that are opposed to what Pope Francis is arguing for? Where are they coming from? Because they're significant in the world today. And I, I'm fully in agreement with Pope Francis's emphasis, and I want to push in that direction. But I'm also raising, and this is a little bit different from what Ahmed is saying about the need for re-education or unlearning. I'm also concerned about the sources of this rising exclusionary attitude that's operative in our world today. And I think that the economic dimension of it is real, but also there are people who feel that their identities, whether it's cultural or religious or uh, ethnic, their identities are being threatened. And so the question that I have is, can we address that in a way that looks toward alleviating some of the pressures that make people feel threatened in those ways? So that would be one of my thoughts about another direction in which we could advance this discussion. Thank you, David. Jose. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, I think we have to be realistic. And realism means, on the one hand, recognizing that we are in a very unique global moment, but also unique national moments within democratic systems. Namely, on the one hand, we, there is a crisis, not only at the global level, the inability of the world system to address global challenges, but also at the national level, uh, the way in which, to a certain extent, a certain consensus could be reached across the aisles is failing everywhere. We have not only intra-faith conflicts, we have international very serious conflicts, People are talking of civil war in the US. People are talking of similar conflicts, let's say in Spain and throughout practically every democratic country is a polarization. Political polarization is a crucial factor of our global crisis. And so the culture of the encounter is not only to go across beyond the nation state and to the stranger. The question is how do we institutionalize again the culture of the encounter within national democratic systems within faith traditions. There is a radical polarization within the Catholic Church for and against Francis. Let's face it, let's be realist. And of course, Francis tried to address it, the culture of the encounter, by opening up first the synod and the family. And we saw how the synod and the family led to a very strong polarization within the Catholic Church. And now we see how his own attempt to institutionalize this culture of the encounter through the synodal process is also creating tensions. So this is not an easy task. A culture of the encounter uh, demands us to face the realities of inequalities, injustices, uh, uh, unequal power, also within the Catholic Church, clericalism and the sexual abuse. So we just have to face all these structural constraints. 
So the notion that we are all equal and created equal in the eyes of God, yes, it's a belief, it's a faith, but the fact that structurally we are in unequal situations of unequal relations of power, of a status, and, and we have to face them. And so we cannot deny them. We cannot try to overcome this reality. We have to face it and we have to work with precisely uh, the culture of the encounter, not only at the international level, but we have to at every level, the local communities, uh, the national communities, so on. Thanks, Jose. And um, that might be a good point at which to draw our, our conversation to a close. We could go on for quite some time, but I think in a remarkably short space of time, less than an hour, we've really laid out a lot of the issues we've been wrestling with um, as a project over the past year. Uh, so there were some hopeful moments in the conversation. We ended up perhaps appropriately back where we are uh, with a focus on the challenges we face at the national as well as the global level in fostering a culture of encounter. Um, lots of work to be done. I wanna thank you all for sharing your thoughts, your essays, and then joining in this conversation. And I look forward to moving forward with you on this conversation into the future. Thank you.